This is another Drive Time segment with Gary. Hey, today uh, we're not coming to you from my pickup truck as usual. We're in an Uber with Doug, our driver, and my lady Kim. Hello. Tonight, we're, Kim and I are on our way to a premiere, a special premiere for the movie 12 Strong. Uh, that movie has a lot of significance to me because I was one of the members of Task Force Dagger that first went into Afghanistan in 2001. And the movie is about one of the teams that went in the north, uh, the, the team that wound up on horseback uh, with General Dostum. So some peers and friends of mine are portrayed in the movie. They're gonna be here tonight. We got a special invitation to the premiere and looking very forward to it. 9-11 uh, was a significant event for the country, but for those of us in fifth group, when it happened, when everybody else was in shock and trying to figure out what to do, we instead were very focused. I was actually on my way to the airport to go plan a, an exercise in the military when the planes hit the World Trade Center. So I um, didn't go to the airport and turned and went to my office and started planning for the invasion uh, of Afghanistan and then when first planes were allowed to fly I was sent on the plane to Tampa to help uh, nail down that plan and later became the first person from fifth group to go establish the base in Uzbekistan where we launched into Afghanistan 9-11 was very significant for those of us in the group we were deadly serious about the task ahead while everybody else was still trying to figure out what happened and how it could happen we were instead getting ready to go um, it was an honor to be one of the people that you knew were going to go back for America to pay back Al-Qaeda for what happened um, it was a very you know it's really hard to describe how that feels if because there's nothing I can think of to tell anybody so that you could relate to it but it was truly an honor and uh, after we got inside Afghanistan you know we'd get by parachute mail that we come from groups of churches Boy Scouts Girl Scouts nurses individuals of people from America just pouring out their love and affection so it was a really um, big honor. We're looking forward to the premiere tonight. I'm hoping it captures some of that sense of duty that everyone felt. Um, looking forward to reconnecting with some guys that I was inside with in 2001. Um, we'll try to get you some photos and pictures uh, from the premiere and sometime after the premiere I'll do a wrap up of the movie and how that compares to what to what happened on the ground in reality. You know, not everything in the movie I know is going to be like it happened, but uh, at least I'll do a, a, a critique of it and share that with everybody. Again, this has been Drive Time with Gary, and thank you. You taking me to school again? Uh-huh, and picking you up. Daddy. Two planes have crashed into the World Trade Center and an apparent terrorist attack. What is that? A part of some drill? Ain't no drill. 19 men attacked our country. The 12 of you will be the first ones to fight back. How do you love your family and leave them to go to war? I have two hours. I'll be really quick. Not a chance. Holding out is the only way I can guarantee you come back to me. War's gonna be over like a week. <laughs> different wars. Odds are we're not all gonna make it out of this one. If we don't take that city, World Trade Center is just the beginning. 
teaming up with the general of the Northern Alliance that we know nothing about. General, you show me exactly where we're going. Over well, the mountains. We take horses. All right, who's ridden before, anyone? Summer camp when I was nine. Spring break when I was pretty hammered. Does it have a name? The name? Hey, this will be fun. We're outnumbered. 50,000 Taliban and Al-Qaeda fighters. We're on our own. I can't order anyone to do this. Do you want to surrender? Keep your finger on the trigger. Stay there. Oh, God. There's no playbook here. We're going to have to write it ourselves. I ain't losing one man on this team. You could stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. We're fighting with horsemen against tanks. The greatest weapon in history is this. There ain't no easy way out. And if you die, that's a letter you and your wife are going to wish you wrote. I made her a promise. I'm coming home. Won't back down. Twelve Strong, the declassified true story of the horse soldiers. Hi, it's Gary. Last time on Drive Time with Gary, Kim and I were on our way to a special premiere for the movie Twelve Strong. Uh, in that video, I promised you that uh, sometime later we'd do a recap or a review of the movie. So that's what I'm doing for my home today. Kim and I went to the premiere as guests of John Mulholland, who's uh, one of the people portrayed in the movie. He was the commander of Task Force Dagger back in 2001. We got to the movie. Um, after the movie aired, there was a Q&A time where you had the three people, John Mulholland, uh, Mark Nooch, and the warrant officer that were there in person, and they took a questions and answers. After that, we were able to go up and chat with them, and I got to reconnect with um, with those guys and chat with the producer, Mark Bruckheimer, uh, a little bit about the movie and, and why they made it. Kim and I enjoyed the movie a lot. It was like, very exciting. Um, was it Hollywood? As I predicted, of course, it was Hollywood. Um, I wish... We all looked as good uh, as the actors did, and uh, that the all the times of actual combat uh, or in a combat zone were as thrilling as those in the movie, but not hardly. Um, what was real to, for me, the terrain uh, at altitude looked real. It's all brown, gray, black. But then what the movie didn't show is that every once in a while you come out and look down on a really lush green looking valley or uh, where a river goes through and that's really green. Of course, maybe it's not so green uh, in reality, but compared to how bleak uh, everything else is, it sure does seem green. Uh, but yeah, seeing the terrain brought back a lot of memories of uh, my time and on the teams that I was on there in 2001. Uh, the other thing that was really fairly realistic was the call for fire when the ODA was bringing in, uh, you know, coordinating the airdrop of bombs. Uh, and that's really what most of the team's focus was. Um, were there cavalry charges by that ODA firing from horseback and all? No. Uh, matter of fact, I think one of them did a test fire from a horse just to see if it could be done. Maybe fired one round uh, and that was it. There was no fighting done from horseback. And, 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 and really, at, at least with that ODA and that 
time, not, you know, uh, close in fighting. Most of our teams, we did not engage in close in fighting. Our job was to provide the, um, the air power of the U.S. government, bring that to bear against the enemy. And we also did some, a lot of medical treatment. The SF medics there patched up a lot of Afghans in those days. And, um, and we did, I think, a lot of work in helping coordinate and plan and, you know, make the, those group of uh, Mujahideen um, more combat effective. Anyway, those were the uh, initial thoughts. Um, again, I really enjoyed the movie. And um, what we'll do is take a short break. And when I come back from that break, we'll talk about some other things that happened in Afghanistan in those early days. And I'll contrast a little bit more for you how the movie portrayed things and what was really happening on the ground. Welcome back to the Drive Time review of the movie 12 Strong. I'd like to take a little bit of time and talk about something that the movie didn't really quite accurately portray and that was the role of the agency or CIA in Afghanistan and how they worked in conjunction with the ODAs from Special Forces. I think in the movie it showed one um, agency guy you know, with, with his hat backwards. Uh, actually there was there was a whole team there and uh, I do believe the team leader uh, did wear his hat backwards some of the time. But that team went in actually before the ODA because the agency would go in first and they would form the deals with the with the warlords, you know, bring some money, pay them. And it was the agency's job to sort of try to keep warlords apart and also get different ones to go after different objectives. So, and it was actually the agency team that was in there ahead of time that radioed back to where we were uh, to let us know that, hey, this team that comes in needs to be ready to ride horses. Uh, so that was one of the criteria that John Mulholland uh, could factor into his, you know, their choice of uh, what teams were going in. So, and that whole time that they were in there, you had agency element and ODA elements that were, uh, once that ODA went in, that were together. Um, again, the um, agency had more of the direct contact with Dostum in the case of the movie, and the ODAs had some, but they were primarily there to bring in the combat power run uh, medical care and you know work with the the fighters and troops while we did have sort of different roles there it was a big a uh, whole lot of cooperation I know there's been a few SF guys that have done interviews uh, after 2001 and, and some from early 2002 that didn't do the agency justice and hey I didn't agree with every decision made by whether it's agency or military on the teams I was in you know this uh, movie 12 strong depicts one ODA that was in for about three weeks I was in Afghanistan for five months between 2001 and and rolling into 2002 on four different teams and, you know, there were good decisions made by all, there were bad decisions made by all. You know, everybody was trying to accomplish the mission. But overall, the cooperation was good. We each had our roles. We each helped in the other roles. So, uh, again, I just want to make sure that, that for the viewers out there, 
that you consider just one it wasn't just ODAs rolling in and uh, went in the day that the agency had an important role too and that they we worked very well together. One of the reasons that you had a few SF teams and a few agency teams in Afghanistan during that time was the U.S. wanted to keep a very small footprint. Let's remember the history of Afghanistan. Look what they did to the English or British, you know, and when they ran them out and killed the last remaining ones, and then what they did to the Soviets in the 80s. Uh, Afghanistan has never been uh, a country to tolerate what they consider invaders. So in order to accomplish what the U.S. wanted in uh, post 9-11, the decisions were made to go in with as small a footprint as possible that those warlords would accept without considering it an invasion and it you know we were going in you know at least in those early days to work with them uh, and with them taking the lead in the combat so I think that's why you didn't see a big invasion with a lot of troops coming in uh, yes, as things developed, we had to bring in larger and larger contingents and, until you wind up with what we have today. But at least at first, it was small and a small footprint. Another thing depicted in the movie that's um, fairly realistic was the interplay with Dostum at first when he was assessing the ODA members as far as their fighting ability. If you remember in the movie, you know, he, he told the team leader he didn't have uh, fighter or killer eyes, but the warrant officer did. Um, that That's kind of true. You had, when you went in, you had to establish your credibility. People in Afghanistan, if you were a Panjshiri uh, or up north, you worked, had worked with and fought for um, Masood. So you had fought against Soviets. A lot of people had fought against Taliban. So for us to waltz in, like saying we know how to fight, you know, these guys are looking at you. They've, they've been fighting their whole lives. And they're assessing whether you know, you really can fight or not, whether you can take the terrain, whether you can take the weather. Um, you know, we carry a lot of equipment. We look like big, bulky uh, things. I think a lot of them wondered, are you going to be able to uh, keep up with us? And you'll find if you talk to the people on that uh, original team, uh, 595, and the agency guys with Dostum, keeping up was hard. Because the Afghans didn't plan for logistics. They just went, often without the means to sustain themselves. Uh, but they, we had a hard time carrying all the ammo, grenades, mines, medical equipment, communications equipment, everything that we had to carry on our bodies. Um, it was difficult to keep up with them. Matter of fact, uh, one of the first teams I was on, were, we were the ones that went up to Tora Bora in uh, December 2001. There was absolutely no way we could climb those mountains with our backpacks, so we hired out uh, local horses, not to ride, but to strap our backpacks on and equipment and drag that up the mountains. Um, still, with just our load-bearing equipment on, which for me was right at, it was 39 pounds of just ammo, a little bit of water, um, some anti-pursuit mines, grenades, medical equipment, you know, all the stuff that you had to have to, to go through a day and, and fight if you needed to, um, equipment. Um, that was about the hardest thing I've ever done was that climb 
from the bottom of the mountains in Tora Bora up to the top where our uh, OP was. Anyway, um, we had to go back to establishing our credibility. So you had to prove yourself. And there were differences. It's based on the individuals that, hey, some guys came across as uh, seasoned combat vets and some guys didn't. And, and isn't that the way it is with life? Um, but everybody, I think they, the Afghans found out that the Americans, no matter how they felt we were, worked as a team. And then as a team, we could accomplish whichever mission we were assigned to do. Um, but, you know, it's a factor to consider when you're operating on a small team like the SF and agency guys were, that that person that you're going to have interface with the warlord um, does need somebody that has credibility with them. You know, to describe it, you're a small team. Maybe on a couple of them that I was on, maybe there were six or eight Americans. You're surrounded by several hundred Afghans. You don't know who's who. These guys may have been fighting, you know, the day before on the other side. There might be Al-Qaeda mixed in with them. And you're at their mercy. Um, so it takes a combination of leadership or that combined with sometimes being tough. Uh, there was one time I walked into one of the warlords and, um, you know, the U.S. wanted him to cease his personal vendetta and fight against another warlord. And, uh, but he was determined to kill him and he told me he wanted to kill him. And I agree. That man, I think, uh, was responsible for killing Nate Chapman, one of the, fir the first SF guy killed in Afghanistan. And so I would have liked him dead too, but the U.S. policymakers said they needed this guy alive. So I had to, you know, tell this guy who commanded these several hundred people that I was living in the middle of uh, that hey, if you persist in going after this guy, you're going to be my enemy. And then we're going to have to fight. Um, you have to be willing to take it all the way. I mean, you have to be, have, be able to back up your word. Uh, I think in a combat environment, it really, you know, it, it really proves who can back up what they say and who can't. If I look back over my time in Afghanistan, was, I've got over four years there, the people that were successful were all able to back up their word. The people that weren't were people that made uh, empty promises or over-exaggerated um, their ability to provide something. And then when you didn't, you, know, you lost credibility. So again, going back to that original point, credibility is crucial not just to get the mission done, but your life can depend on it. You know, those people had to believe that, okay, there's only a few of them, but they're the baddest, you know, what's around. And when this guy says he'll kill, me, kill us, he will. Um, I went to one of the early meetings with... Um, sort of as a bodyguard for uh, John Mulholland, um, the commander of Task Force Dagger, Dagger. It was a meeting with several of the key leaders, um, I think Atta and a bunch of others uh, were there, I don't think Dostum was. And so we're in the outer room, and so you're in, these, in a room surrounded by all these guys with equipment. Well. I only had a few, um, I had been riding on the outside of a vehicle with a AK vest on and a few magazines in it and a couple in my rifle. And one of the Afghans grabbed my interpreter and went over and I guess it was, uh, you know, some old fashioned bragging by military men and he 
made sure I understood and everybody in that room understood that, you know, I only had um, X amount of magazines and, um, and he had a, a bunch more on him and he was making, you know, trying to belittle me and, uh, you know, show how big he was in front of the, the, the big Americans, I guess. And uh, I remember that I, in the middle of this group of Afghans, got the interpreter and said, okay, I want you to translate this exactly word for word. So what I told that Afghan was that I only have, I forget what it was, uh, let's say the double stack in my weapon at the time, that I only have um, 60 rounds. I said, that is 60 of you dead, because every bullet I have will kill one of you. And you can have all the bullets you want, but you're not going to be as quick or efficient as I am. And I glared at him. Um, you know, that's just an example. You know, he eventually backed down. But that's an example to me of what you have to do. And if you do that, you have to be ready to back it up. And um, other ways to build credibility. I know for me, I... Um, at one of the places I went uh, called Orgoon that we were doing raids and getting a lot of ammunition caches and when we get that you wind up we get this big giant truck a local truck and it would be filled with old mines rockets mortars uh, ammunition uh, grenades every conceivable type of armament that had been there during the Soviet times. And it's a lot of them had the protective covers taken off, fairly unstable. And um, we would pile all that in the back of a truck, and then the lowest of the Afghans, you know, they would always get the two lowest guys and put them in the truck, and they have to drive this back to the place where we were storing everything. And uh, it made me think of a time when I was in Yemen doing a demining mission and on the demining mission a similar truck full of mines with some Yemenis in it uh, was driving back and something made ignited one of the mines and the whole truck blew. It essentially disintegrated and vaporized the truck and those two guys in it. Um, Anyway, so when we first started doing this, the Americans would uh, get in a little pickup truck and drive a few hundred meters away from the truck full of explosives. And then, I don't know, I, I just believe that, hey, I want to show these guys that we're in it with them and I'll take the same risk as them. So I used to climb up in the truck of explosives with the Afghans. You know, there'd be two guys that spoke not a word of English. I recall them looking at me like, what, you'll get in here with us? And, uh, and then d them just laughing and playing music uh, as we rode along in this truck and me thinking that, wow, I hope uh, I'm not just gonna get vaporized all for just trying to prove a point and establish my credibility. But hey, Evidently, it didn't work, so I'm still here. Um, but that, and then I would always jump in and help the Afghan average soldier do work, whether it was unloading trucks or whatever. And when you do that, they formed a bond with you. They don't believe that you're just some distant American that's going to use them as cannon fodder, that you're invested in them and that you're going to look out for them, you're going to take care of them, you'll fight with them. And I think that's one of the things I like about being on a small team in an environment uh, like we were in Afghanistan. So at this point, let's take another quick break and be back with you in a few minutes to talk a little bit more about some of the things that, uh, or paint a little bit better picture of how it really was on the ground in 2001. Hi and welcome back. 
we're here reviewing the movie 12 Strong. And admittedly, it's, uh, I think, uh, last segment ranged a little bit far. So I'll try to bring it back more to uh, focus on the movie. One of the things I did want to mention was, uh, you know, talk about Mike Spann a little bit. So most of you may know that Mike Spann was the first American killed in Afghanistan in 2001. And he was on an agency team, the team that was went in uh, actually ahead of the ODA that's depicted in the movie 12 Strong. Mike was killed uh, in the prison riot there in Mazari Sharif. Um, so that's another whole story and uh, tragic turn of events. But Mike was a hero. I got to meet him some because I'm the one that uh, helped coordinate putting that team in um, and met with them uh, up in Tashkent, uh, Uzbekistan at the embassy before they came down to get things going. Um, matter of fact, the photo that's in the agency museum at Langley of that first agency team out in front of a helicopter, I'm the one that, uh, that took that photo. Also at the premiere of the movie 12 Strong that we went to, Mike's daughter was there. I'd met her two years ago at a charity event that provides college funds for the fallen, uh, the children of the fallen CIA and special ops people called Spookstock. And she w had just graduated from college and gave one of the keynote speeches at that concert event. But she was at the uh, premiere too, and I got to chat with her a few minutes um, after the movie was over. So, you know, I think uh, as far as the movie goes, again, I enjoyed the movie. It was very entertaining. Um, I thought a few of the aspects were realistic. Uh, the combat part and uh, being handsome is, I mean, maybe some guys are that handsome, but uh, most of us aren't. So, you know, there was some Hollywood in it. But again, it was entertaining. I hope that it portrays the sincere desire, the sense of honor the, and privilege that the people both from the agency and fifth group felt at being called on to go to Afghanistan to try to stand up for America uh, in the wake of 9-11. Um, I hope to be able to talk a little bit more about that um, in some future videos, uh, but you know, for this one and, and, and this movie review, I, I guess I'll leave it with that. Um, and I, I wish everyone out there could live a life. Uh, if you, when you enter the military and some of the other, um, whether it's law enforcement, firemen, uh, EMT, and you want to serve other people, uh, I just hope everybody gets a chance to have the feeling like we had in those days um, right after 9-11 at really feeling like you served your purpose. For me, and I, by that time I got to there, I had 20 years in the military. And I felt all that was leading up to that time, that time where I could be there on behalf of my country. We could go into how that makes me feel about uh, certain football players and stuff now, but uh, I guess that ought to be enough for another, another time as well. So that sort of wraps it up on the movie review. Um, you know, for me, I was on the initial team um, that went wound up going to Tora Bora. We went into Jalalabad first. Um, then I got told to jump onto another team and was with the first team that went to coast. Um, it 
was not a military team and uh, Nate Chapman, the first SF guy killed, was a member of that team. And then from Coast, I split off and led another group um, into Urgoon and established a base there. And then I actually was pulled out of that um, and asked to go be the tactical leader of another non-military team uh, that was in support of Operation Anaconda as that was getting ready to happen. So uh, hopefully on later videos we can talk some about those. I particularly would like to talk about Tora Bora since uh, there's been a lot of talk about what happened in Tora Bora, how Bin Laden got away, and I think no books that I've read uh, and no accounts that I've read really cover the story and how that went. So uh, maybe we'll get a chance to share on a video like that. Hey, thank you for your time. This has been another Drive Time with Gary uh, video. Thanks.